Hey, everybody, and welcome to the THCV Book Club. I'm Jessica DeMassa, and that's Matthew Holt. Matthew, you want to introduce our guest today? Yeah, our guest is somebody who's appeared on THCV a decent amount, uh, and uh, uh, it's now, we're now describing him as a medical historian. This is Mike McGee, um, a doctor, started off in private practice in urology way back when, um, spent some time after that working at uh, uh, Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia, and then later on went to work for Pfizer, and since then has written this, uh, has, has written a whole bunch, um, been, a, uh, uh, been a been a well-known medical broadcaster, but also wrote this book, Code Blue, which you can see in the background of his thing, and I'll hold up the cover for it there, which is a great book called Inside America's Medical Complex, sorry, Medical Industrial Complex, um, and uh, has a lot, it's a really fascinating book, which is kind of a history of how America got here, America's healthcare system got to where it is, but also sort of my role in it as well, because <laughs> Mike was certainly involved in a couple of uh, really interesting parts, which we'll get to. So, uh, Mike, welcome to the book club. Well, thanks so much, Matthew, and thank you, Jess. I, I appreciate having the honor of joining you here and talking a little bit about Code Blue. Okay. Yeah, Mike, we want to jump right in and just have you start out by defining the medical industrial complex. And, you know, as I was reading through this, I was like, oh, God, it's like you start to as you you realize your role in healthcare, wherever it is, it's like you're mired in this. You may not even realize that it's happening to you. So um, let's start us out there so we can bring everybody kind of up to speed on, you know, the, the really one of the main points throughout that carries out throughout the book is that you're advocating that there is this medical industrial complex. Um, very much like the military industrial complex that Eisenhower talked about. So t tell us about this. Who's involved? What's this complex all about? Well, I guess the first thing I ought to say is that it's not new. Uh, in fact, it's seven or eight decades old, and it actually uh, got full birth during World War II and then persisted since then. Um, it's a collusive network um, which involves the AMA and involves academic physicians, the leadership of hospitals and pharmaceuticals and the insurance industry, as well as elements of government, who have together behind closed doors eliminated progressively all of the checks and balances that would normally bring um, us uh, transparency and some element of control and competitiveness and strategic planning. Uh, in the medical industrial complex, these elements discovered each other right after World War II and basically have been working as hard as they could to preserve each other's status quo and share profit as they went along. Everybody I learned after a final 10 years at Pfizer, everybody is in on the deal and in on the profits, except for the patient. Yeah, it definitely has this feeling of like a, um, I don't know, like as I'm reading through this, I felt like it was like, these are things you only hear about in finance. Or these are things you only hear about in sports. Like there's this whole other like, you know, these back office dealings, very mob-like kind of uh, th things happening here. I like the word collusion in that. Um, and the fact that, you know, you really kind of make it out to seem, and it sounds like rightfully so, that this is all just built on, you know, profiteering. And, well, you, you know, know we, we tend to feel like we have a national health care system. There's nothing that could be farther from the truth. We don't really have any national system in the United States. We're an outlier amongst all the other developed nations. What makes us feel like we have a national healthcare system is the fact that we have a series of guilds. For example, we have the AMA for the doctors, we have the American Hospital Association for the hospitals, we have pharma for the pharmaceutical industry, and um, they are organized according to na a national system and under that state systems and sometimes under that county systems. And all of these members belong, and the main thing they do is protect their own fees. And uh, the way they do that is by having large offices in Washington, D.C. filled with lobbyists. Now, what makes it collusive is the fact that those government relations programs of each of the guilds coordinates with each other so that their government relations objectives integrate. And what we think of as a national system is actually an integrated lobbying system, which manages to increasingly 
add money to their coffers and protect their vested interests while the others of us suffer. And of course, when you get hit with something like COVID-19, that's when you really see who's on the inside and who's on the outside. Say more about that. How did that, how, how has this revealed things to you or new things since the book was written? Well, you know, um, what are some of the things that Trump has said about COVID-19? He says, well, it's too complicated. And he says, we got the best healthcare system in the world. And he says, you know, science is going to be our silver bullet. It's going to come in. Look what it did for me. I, I took the cocktail and look how great I'm feeling now. Uh, and it's science over planning. So it's uh, if simply we invest in good science, you can cure things at the last moment. You don't have to plan. You don't have to have any reserve inventory. You don't have to have a system that allows hospitals to work cooperatively with each other and move ventilators and, and doctors and nurses where they're needed most. You don't need any of that. All you need is that silver bullet, you know, the hydroxychloroquine or whatever. We've been promising that kind of an approach for 70 or 80 years. In fact, uh, back when we left World War II, the big difference between us and Canada, UK, Germany, and all the rest was that we said to ourselves, hey, you know what? If we could just defeat disease the way we just defeated the Nazis, health will be left in its wake. <laughs> so it was this like fundamental misunderstanding of what health is. We've thought at that time and still a large number of people today feel that if you can just defeat disease with these, this great science, uh, automatically you'll have a healthy population. And of course, nothing could be farther from the truth. So Mike, I want to, I want to, uh, dive back into the book for a second. There are a few characters who, who you may come to life, right? People probably don't know about, who had a great role in the history of this. So, so I just want you to tell us a little bit about them and a little bit about what they did and why it matters. So the first sure. one is uh, Vannevar Bush, um, who was uh, heading up the G5 on the, in the World War II. Most yeah, Vannevar Bush is a remarkable character in that uh, brilliant man, son of a, uh, uh, a ship uh, runner and... Um, you know, grew up in the Boston elite academics, uh, went all the way through industry, uh, actually started Raytheon and the beginnings that became Texas Instrument. He was a guy who invented the first mainframe computer, and they used it for decoding in the late 30s to get a, a lead on uh, Germany. Um, so he was brilliant. He was part of the Carnegie Foundation. He was hired by FDR to run their science programs in preparation for World War II. That is all known. What is not known is that Vannevar Bush's first hire was one of his very best friends. This guy had been a great friend of his since 1933. And that friend's name was George Merck, the head of Merck Pharmaceuticals. In addition to that, the people that he hired underneath him to head up his scientific research program, to head up uh, his government relations program, uh, all of the major posts were filled with other Merck employees. What makes it really fascinating is not that they were fabulously successful, they were, and they did it by uh, not only developing this unique public-private collaboration, but also getting FDR to pay a fortune. So they basically threw cash at the problem and uh, this got everybody working in sync. Well, the fascinating thing is at the end of World War II, these guys did not disband. These guys all went back to Merck. And in fact, uh, Vannevar Bush became the chairman of the board of Merck and many of the others who worked for Vannevar Bush went on to become successively CEOs, the head legal officers, and so forth of Merck. So the point being uh, that World War II was the training ground for people who were going to succeed in the medical industrial complex. You got along by going along. And it was not simply a matter of padding each other's pockets with cash. This was a integrated career ladder. So if, if you were on the inside in World War II, uh, for example, if you were a corporation who worked on the penicillin project in World War II, 40 years later, 
Nine of the 10 largest pharmaceutical companies 40 years later were involved in that penicillin project. If you were not part of that penicillin project, you didn't have a chance because the seeds of the medical industrial complex, the, the relationships, um, the commitment uh, at all costs, and usually the cost was patient welfare, at all costs to help each other profit, were sown in World War II and persist to this day. So uh, let me give you another couple of names that come up in the book and have uh, been from uh, two women, Florence Mahoney and Mary Lasker. So probably not known to many people today, but a uh, huge influence. Who were they and what were they doing? Well, those two gals uh, happen to be married to two very powerful char characters. Uh, one turned out to be the father of public relations and marketing uh, in the United States, and the other owned a series of uh, very powerful newspapers and had a father-in-law who had been a senator. Uh, but uh, these two women, well-meaning as they were, uh, teamed up in the late 30s, first with Margaret Sanger, and then when Margaret Sanger ran into a series of problems, they switched over and decided what they were going to focus on was medical research. Now, at the time, there was no NIH, there were no institutes, uh, but uh, Mary Lasker had decided that uh, what they really needed, uh, the only thing they really needed for human progress was scientific progress. So she wanted to throw all of her uh, philanthropic power behind this initiative, which is great. I mean, that's terrific. Uh, well, she was wildly successful by working the inside deal. And the inside deal had to do with uh, her creating what she liked to call uh, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in America, and it was the Lasker Award. So she would handpick uh, the academician she wanted to honor each year, and those academicians would be very grateful. In fact, they'd be so grateful that they would come and testify before Congress if, they, if she gave them a call. And she basically picked winners and losers uh, in the what would become the National Institute of Health. She created and identified where we would focus our energy. We had no strategic planning. We had no ha national healthcare system like Canada had at the time. But we did have winners and losers. And the nice thing about Florence and about Mary is they got to pick who would be the winners and losers. And they got to decide whether we would throw money at kidney or whether we would throw money at breast or what, what, what would be the diseases that Mary and Florence would like us to pursue. So it gives you an example of the fact that uh, our system is totally privatized. It is totally profit driven. In other countries like Canada, they would spent 10 or 20 years and did between the end of World War II and 1965, creating a plan. Canada said, as they came out of World War II, how do we make Canada and Canadians healthy? They then spent 10 years debating that question and another 10 years deciding who would govern their system. 20 years of hard work to create that system. We, on the other hand, said, look, all we gotta do is defeat disease. If we make it really, really profitable to make discoveries, if we get the Mary Laskers and her philanthropic friends and the Florence Mahoney and her powerful newspaper connections uh, and throw marketing, advertising and dollars at this problem, why we'll just create cures for cancer and we'll create cures for every disease that Mary decides is noteworthy. So. Uh, as a result, here we are, 70 years later, COVID hits. How do we approach COVID? Do we have a public health response? Do we have the capacity to see our way through to do something simple like put on masks or create social distancing? No, we have none of that. What are we going to do? We're going to get 10 companies to make a fortune if they can just quickly turn the dime and find a vaccine that's going to get rid of this. Nobody's saying, okay, fine. Suppose you are that successful that quick, which is not gonna happen, but let's say that it did. Nobody is saying, well, what about two years from now? Will we be in the same mess again? You know, who's going to give us the capacity to make Americans healthy? Who's gonna finally stop and say, 
How are we going to make this country healthy? How are we going to treat all of our citizens? How are we going to integrate the social determinants? Nobody has spoken those words in 70 or 80 years. And the reality is until we stop and do that, we're going to continue to be vulnerable to things like COVID. So say, say a word you also bring up to date with sort of the interrelationship between patient advocacy and the pharmaceutical business around specific, specific diseases. You have a couple of examples of that in the book. So just talk a little bit about, about some of those. Well, you know, one of the things that uh, caused me to write this book, I left Pfizer at 2007 because I just uh, began to feel more and more compromised. I, I knew something was wrong and I was having trouble putting my fingers on it. I, like a lot of my colleagues, was uh, trying to do something worthwhile with my life and, and be useful to people and thought that I was when I started out. But increasingly, what it became clear to me was that uh, if I was successful, what that meant is that I was helping to tear down the kind of checks and balances that protect human beings. I was becoming part of the problem. So uh, I think in many ways, one of the jobs uh, that I had as the head of global medical affairs was to integrate with all the patient advocacy groups. And the reality was that the patient advocacy groups, uh, many of them, 80, 90% of their budgets were supported by the Pfizer's of the world. Uh, in return for those dollars, which did not come free, they would be willing to uh, amass letters that could be sent to Congress, be part of campaigns. So they, the, the ones that were most compromised would be willing to do pretty much anything in return for that support that supported, you know, their salaries, it supported their, their housing, it supported everything. Um, and so they were very compromised. Similarly, I had oversight of many of the academicians who would serve as uh, advisors to uh, Pfizer, as they do to many pharmaceutical companies. And uh, they, too, uh, would pretty much do anything. If, if they did feel really, really compromised, they'd hold their tongues, um, you know, which was oftentimes more valuable when you knew somebody was not going to criticize you. But in any case, um, there was an enormous conflict of interest built into the system, both with the uh, top academic um, physicians and researchers across the country, as well as the heads of these laudable patient advocacy groups. So, um, you know, as a result, when something like that happens, uh, let's take, for example, muscular dystrophy, where you know, the, the parents uh, are heroic in, in trying to fight for their children, and uh, they are desperate to have a new discovery. They'll do almost anything to preserve that hope, and uh, that means even forcing through therapies that the FDA is uncomfortable with because they're either dangerous or because they don't work. Well, you know, if you're a pharmaceutical company and you've just invested, you know, a couple of billion dollars getting uh, something almost approved and uh, you can get these patient advocacy groups behind you to force these things through, uh, they can put enough pressure. They can bring these uh, patients, these little kids uh, up to Congress and it can be very effective. So, um, you know, if you're a guy like me uh, who had been on every you know, at every point in the medical industrial complex and who was an expert in medical communications and in medical affairs, uh, it was fairly easy then to manipulate these things in a way that would uh, at the very least benefit the company. Uh, now, whether it benefited the patients in the long run, oftentimes not. So the book outlines uh, multiple cases of this where you know, people enter well-intentioned, but we have checks and balances for a reason. And in many ca cases, it's to protect us against ourselves um, or to make sure that there is widespread benefit, that it isn't just the people with a lot of money that benefit. For example, um, back uh, in the beginning of the first Reagan term, uh, we had uh, 2,000 or 28,000 uh, patents that had derived 
from uh, government funding. And these were owned by the government. And part of the reason was that we wanted to make sure that if these were going to be utilized, that they would uh, be accessible to all citizens, whether they're poor or, or whether they're rich and whether they're black or white or brown, there'd be equal access. Well, uh, when Reagan got in and we were in the middle of a recession, um, Bob Dole and Birch Bay got together uh, by because Purdue had Purdue University had some discoveries that they wanted patent uh, ownership for, and they basically wiped out government patents. Uh, after that time, it didn't matter if NIH dollars led you to your discovery, government had no position there. So what we have today is a lot of people thriving, these researchers at academic institutions and the institutions themselves. And one could say, well, what's wrong with that? You know, that leads to innovation. Well, the problem with that is that it fundamentally transformed the way academic medical institutions feel. So now it feels as if they are research enterprises, which happen to do a little patient care on the side. Right. Where before they were, you know, these uh, towers of God taking care of us all, right? And, you know, occasionally you'd have a great discovery. No, we flipped that. Now we've got, you know, uh, glass centers for cancer discoveries and so forth. So the, the My point being, you know, you gotta, you know, you gotta understand that uh, all of these moves uh, didn't just happen. Uh, the thing has become complex because they want it complicated. The more complicated it is, the less we understand. The less we understand, the more we're going to pay them. I want to ask you real quick about your experience with um, with Viagra and with the world out there, because I sure. feel like, you know, we're listening to you now. You've written this book, which is, I mean, it's, you know, the AMA goes under the bus. The NIH goes under the bus. There's a whole bunch of people that go under the bus. You obviously had a change of heart, but but in the heat of that, you're somebody who profited from this, just like the the, the people right. that you're kind of pointing your finger back at now. So I guess right. explain to us, tell us a little bit, because I thought the Viagra chapter was just really fascinating because it really is like one of those, watch the sausage being made. Oh God, that's an unfortunate analogy, Jessica, but it, it really yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. It really is this sense of this insider perspective on what was going on to, to create that product to roll it out to market, to create really like the medicalization of um, erectile dysfunction. You invented the term. Like, I mean, so talk me through your role in that. And then I'm hoping where we can go after that is what made you finally realize, no, nah, I don't want to be part of this anymore. But start sure. with your role with Viagra and, and tell us that story. Maybe give us a little bit of a synopsis of what that chapter was about. Sure. Well, uh, 18 months before uh, Viagra had approval, uh, they hired a, a national headhunter and they were looking for a physician to uh, be the voice of, of Viagra. The CEO at Pfizer at the time was a guy named Bill Steer and Bill Steer is a brilliant guy, um, came out of the marketing world, uh, but he doesn't particularly like the limelight. And he knew that Viagra was gonna be a culture buster. Uh, and the two things that he wanted to make sure did not happen was, number one, uh, that the uh, product uh, got attacked in the public sector and uh, uh, was removed from market. And number two, he didn't want the company to become known as a sex company. Uh, they had a lot of uh, major block blockbusters at the time. Bill was very proud of the science, and he wanted to make sure that he wasn't overwhelmed by, you know, uh, crazy discussions out of control about his sex drug. So anyhow, they were looking for a physician. And when the headhunter found me, I was a senior VP at Pennsylvania Hospital, and he sort of died and went to heaven because I had a strong background in uh, television and radio by then. I had been a urologist. Um, I had worked with sociologists uh, defining what the patient-physician -physi relationship involved and what one needed to do to support it. Uh, and I had major connections, having been a communications consultant at the AMA with the American Hospital Associations and others. So I had all of what they wanted to be the face of Viagra. So they hired me 18 months before this thing was approved. And during those 18 months, 
they put together a group of 20 or so top social scientists across the globe, including theologians, philosophers, uh, a variety of, of different uh, psychiatrists who are involved in sex therapy, but also uh, individuals with wide ranging connections into the Vatican and everywhere else. And basically the job of that committee was to identify every public issue that would come up when this thing was launched. And they did a pretty darn good job of it. The one thing they didn't quite predict was that people would die of the drug. And the people that were dying of the drug were people who had cardiac problems and were on nitroglycerin. And when they took this drug, it caused vasodilation and their blood pressure dropped out. So in the beginning for the first couple of weeks, there were a series of deaths and the FDA began to list them up on their website. Uh, these and other issues, for example, uh, the, the naughty issue of why did Pfizer with its own employees cover Viagra, but they weren't covering birth control pills at the time, things like that. Right. Those, <laughs> right. those types of issues were the issues that they involved me in. So there were 3,000 media requests in the first six weeks in our New York offices, and I was involved with many of those, but more importantly, for the next two years, I traveled around the US and the world making the case for why insurers ought to cover this drug. And the case that I was making was that um, this was a marker disease, that basically the people who had small vessel disease leading to erectile dysfunction also likely had diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, blocked coronaries, and didn't know about it. And that if it took erectile dysfunction to get him into the office to have some basic studies that would reveal these things, that at the end of the day, the insurer would save money uh, because they would find this out earlier and they'd be able to manage it. Anyway, that, uh, that worked. That, when you were doing that, did you feel yeah. good about that at the time? Like, did you genuinely, like, because I think like there's a lot of us, right? And like, this is how this happens in the industry. Right. Like, you think you're doing something that's helpful. So it's like, did yes. you believe that line as you were talking, talking it through to these different insurers or different positions and talking about the benefit right. of bringing those folks in the office or like at what point did it hit you that it's like wait a minute i'm part of this co this complex yeah. I, you know i'd like to hear that like that moment so for anybody yeah. else who's out there working in healthcare we can have our yeah. aha and learn from yours well you got to go back to the um, late 80s and early 90s when everybody was reading in search of excellence and everyone was uh, following deming's uh, health management. And, you know, there are no bad people that are just bad systems. So people like me, I, I had a team and I worked with sociologists at Jefferson Medical College uh, and at Pennsylvania Hospital. And so what my focus was on, what I was an expert in was cross-sector partnering. So basically the thinking was that um, where you had these integrated uh, career ladders, as we do in the medical industrial complex, um, people like me who could speak the language of every sector, all right, had had experience in hospitals, in doctors' organizations, in pharmaceuticals, and so forth, and could speak their languages and understood their cultures, people like me could be hired to cross over that divide and we would harmonize the different uh, sectors that were part of the complex. And at the end of the day, the best of what each sector had to offer would infuse into that other area. That was the, the theory, the feeling, how, what I based my, my career trajectory on. Uh, what I learned when I actually was inside it is that everybody was already on the take. Uh, that everybody had their hand in everybody else's pocket, number one. Number two, all of these different guilds were in the process of moving to Washington and hiring more lobbyists than you could throw a stick at because they had decided that the way that they would be able to massively increase profit, especially when the research apparatus came up dry, which it did throughout the first decade of the next millennium, uh, you needed then reimbursement and you needed to break down the barriers that prevented you from profiteering. So 
what I learned when I was inside was number one, everybody was already bought. So, I, I, and the way I discovered that is I was very successful at what I was doing without even trying. And suddenly I realized the reason was not because I was successful. It was fixed. They were, they were already, they were, the game was already fixed, right? So then uh, getting to the end of your question, uh, so anyhow, Viagra is uh, very successful and, uh, and I'm sitting there and things are progressing and I'm progressively learning, you know, this is not feeling right to me. And so, uh, as I described in the book one night, my wife and I went to a movie uh, uh, about a pharmaceutical company that uh, is in Nigeria and is experimenting uh, with uh, children with meningitis and uh, the children die and and so forth. It's very dramatic based on a, a popular novel at the time. And as I'm walking home, my wife says, um, well, that's Pfizer. Don't you think that's Pfizer? And so um, I uh, gave a spirited defense uh, how this was not possible in any way. Uh, and her response was, boy, you've really drunk the Kool-Aid. And I think it was at that moment when she said, you know, you've really drunk the Kool-Aid that I uh, began to realize, well, you know, my job as I learned it and did it, I think, well, from their standpoint was um, to basically make the best case possible for what was going on uh, behind closed doors, what the purpose of it was, what were the reasons they were behaving the way they were. The reality was there had been a case similar to that movie. Uh, it had been litigated for over 10 years. Uh, it basically was resolved with Pfizer paying a huge amount of money, but never claiming uh, th that they were responsible. And when I then began to look at the Pfizer rap sheet, uh, which I describe at the end of Code Blue, it went on for pages and pages and pages and pages. And so I think it was at that point that I said, um, you know, at the end of the day, what I thought was doing some good, there you go, there's a rap sheet. There's the rap <laughs> sheet, yeah. That's right. At the end of the day, um, I decided that um, I had to stop, number one, because I felt like I was losing my soul. But in addition, I knew it would take a long time. Even though I had been on the inside, I didn't really understand it all. I knew it would take a long time and it did take almost 10 years to unravel it and get it all down and documented in this book. So uh, this was my way of saying, okay, I spent 10 years of Pfizer. Now I'm gonna spend 10 years trying to help explain the medical industrial complex because it's not, just Pfizer. It's not just the pharmaceutical industry. Right. Uh, in fact, today, uh, one could argue it's reached its finest uh, and, and most sophisticated criminal nature in the pharmaceutical benefit management companies, which <laughs> are allowed uh, in an opaque way to basically have kickbacks to each of the guilds uh, and not tell anybody and you can be up there as a patient at the counter and you get your bill and you say, what? And the truth of the matter is there may have been five, six, seven transactions and money sharing before that bill came to you. So how in God's name in America is that legal? How is it possible that we're one of only two countries in the world that allow direct to consumer advertising? How is it possible we're the only developed nation that has no negotiating capability when it comes to pharmaceuticals that has as its third leading cause of death, hospital deaths due to safety? I mean, how, how is that possible? How can we pay twice as much and have more childhood deaths than everyone else? How, how is that possible? So. You know, Code Blue tries to explain how this happened and why we don't need to stay married to this very odd approach that we've taken. You know, where nobody else in the world has employer-based health insurance. It's ridiculous. 
And yet we've convinced each other that this is the best healthcare system in the world. My God, look at COVID. <laughs> if it's the best healthcare system in the world, why do we have, you know, approaching a quarter of a million people dead? How is it that, you know, places like North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana have no ICU beds now because the Sturgis people decided they're going to ride motorcycles together. And we're so determined to be self-destructive that we allowed them all to congregate with each other. What kind of a culture does that, right? So Code Blue is, uh, you know, it's a tale about American medicine, but it also speaks to America's unique culture, profit above all, predatory capitalism that literally drives us all into the grave. So uh, I, before, before we move on to like, what do we do about it, what's happening next? Make, make no, you referenced one movie, which was, which was The Constant Gardener. Um, uh, did you see Love and Other Drugs, which was the rom-com based around Viagra? <laughs> and Hathaway and Jake Gyllenhaal were in that one. Uh, oh, it was a very entertaining movie where Drake is like the Pfizer, he's a Pfizer drug rep selling Viagra, and she's taking bus trips for people up to Canada to buy drugs cheaper. At <laughs> it's really, and they, they put it, oh, oh it's pretty, pretty good. You're rom com watching this. Uh, well, that's, 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 I spent a lot of time in airplanes. Like, I, I feel the same way you do. The stunned look on Mike's face is like, what? <laughs> I'm, I'm just worried. I haven't seen any good movie. And then, of course, we have Outbreak, right? Which is also the movie in the 2000s. Oh, my God. Sure. This place looks more like a than it is anything. Like, <laughs> Well, you know, it, it's a funny thing because, you know, you uh, you can imagine you, when you get deep, I uh, got deep into this, it, it, if you allowed yourself, you could become very depressed. But the reality well, is, yeah. uh, look what has been accomplished with something like the Affordable Care Act um, that literally a Republican Party has spent a decade trying to destroy. But consider this. Uh, number one, uh, we have fleshed out that 70% at least of the American public believes in universal health care and, and health coverage as a human right. Number two, we have established huge majorities uh, insist on pre-existing conditions being protected. Um, number three, we have agreed on what a basic benefit package needs to be, which is not a small thing to have accomplished because there was a lot of battling up to this point over that. So those are just three things that were built into the Affordable Care Act. So the reality is we are farther along in moving to a rational system than we realize. And I try to bring that out in Code Blue. I mean, even though Buffett was right when he said this thing is the tapeworm on the American economy. And even yeah. though we have 16 workers for every one doctor, and half of those workers have absolutely no clinical role, this is doesn't mean that we don't have assets. We, we certainly have spent enough money at this. We've, we're spending four trillion years. So there's plenty of money in the system oh, already. Yeah. We have some of the best scientists, doctors and nurses and public health officials in the world. We do have the best schools to create these kind of people in the world. We have a thriving research enterprise. My only argument is that we're subsidizing it. I would prefer to see it go on its own, including those physicians who decide they want to be researchers. I'm all for them. I want them to hit it rich. I just don't want them to make believe they're doctoring. You know, I want them to just come clean and say, we are researchers working for industry and we'll be filling out a lobbying form like everyone else. So we have the assets to pull this off. The main thing we haven't done is what Canada did in 1947. They sat down and they said, how are we going to make Canada and all Canadians healthy? That's what America's got to do at this moment. Mike, I want to ask you a question real quick about, you know, you mentioned Warren Buffett in there. You're talking about, you know, um, research and, you know, I, I, I report on the innovation space. And so, you know, I think of Warren Buffett, I think of right now, the whole Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan, Amazon Haven experiment that's kind right. of, you know, petered out into nowhere, right? But, you know, what it made me think of, and one, one of the things I was wondering when I was reading the book was, you know, about some of these non-traditional healthcare companies that are pushing harder than ever and gaining some ground in healthcare. 
So right. you know, you're looking at the tech industry, you've got Apple, you've got Google, you're looking at retailers like Walmart, um, CVS, um, despite their, uh, their vertical integration in other areas, but you're looking right. at, you know, other retails like grocery, grocery store chains that are traditional, traditionally have not pushed into healthcare. You know, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, do these companies, you know, as they're putting pressure on the incumbents, do they have the ability to shift the medical industrial complex or do they end up making it stronger as those incumbents start to band together and hold on to what's theirs? What do you think? I think they could do very well in, in a uh, approach that had a strong emphasis on strategic planning and public health. Uh, because think about it, um, in, in order to achieve public health, you also have to integrate housing, jobs, safety and security, clean environment, uh, transportation, all those things have to be not only financially supported, but you have to begin to move some of the coders, some of the people that make a living selling health insurance that we really shouldn't have selling health insurance. You have to move them into these uh, other social areas that integrate with health and, and welfare. So uh, my feeling is that uh, the companies that are already employing large number of people, just take, for example, the underutilization of pharmacists in this country. Uh, we're just beginning to increase their scope of practice. But what if uh, a CVS was in a big way into home-centered health care? What if they were to assign geographic areas uh, and have uh, mobile services that could be called on demand. If your kid wakes up with a sore throat, somebody shows up and does a swab, you don't have to go to the doctor's office. Um, what if we learn from um, the use of technology during this crisis and began to uh, aggressively capture those best practices and use those, and what if they were? Uh, funded as part of healthcare would they, have the, would they have the power to shift this medical industrial complex? And I think CVS might be a terrible example, but like maybe like an Amazon, where it's like they're not, or they don't, they don't already own a health insurance company. Yeah. They don't already own one of the like six PBMs in this country. But somebody like Amazon, do they have the power to shift that medical industrial complex and and untie some of those bonds that have been in place for the last, you know, eighty years? I would argue on their own, no, because what happens in a pure capitalistic private system as we have here is that number one, uh, every move that one makes another will counter make. And more importantly, uh, there are sub players and sub sub pub pl players who find their way into the cracks. And so if you have multiple players, what happens is everybody finds a way of taking some profit out. And uh, some of it ends up being criminal. For example, if you really look at the opioid epidemic, as I do in Code Blue, uh, you can see it started with a single guy, uh, Arthur Sackler. And he was the guy who invented most of the marketing techniques uh, like detail men, like DTC advertising, like uh, videos, um, to promote the uh, sale of drugs, um, uh, like uh, paying doctors to be on advisory committees. One guy, right, starts in 1950, but, but what, where are you 70 years later? That one guy's been multiplied, applied 100,000 times, right. and we end up with such an epidemic from opioids that for the first time in our entire history, uh, the, the life expectancy of white males plummets. So, you know, this is what can happen when you have a system that has no public accountability. So uh, could a CVS type of a player or an Amazon um, actually uh, impose itself to say, we're going to get this straightened out? Yes, but not by trying to do it the way they did uh, with the tool Gawandi. Uh, what, what they have to do is say, uh, we believe in the public administration of a national health care system will help you do it. Uh, and when you do it, we want to make sure you leave enough room. We've got 50 states and more territories for experimentation. 
Uh, we want you to commit to the notion of innovation and experimentation, just like in Canada, where the individual provinces are allowed to experiment and innovate. Um, and uh, uh, but, but we want national oversight. We demand it. We demand a public system because this is a public service and we cannot have equality and access for all unless it's run in a public way. That means you guys got to figure out not only what you're going to make, but who's going to run it. Right. And it can't be the AMA and pharma and a few from here and a few from there. You've got to have people that truly represent the American public. So if I were Jeff Bezos, yeah, I would be saying, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to throw my full weight of Amazon behind this because look at the opportunity. All of these social areas are underdeveloped. We need infrastructure investment anyhow. We need a green environment. Uh, we need people to be fully productive in these towns and cities that are dying. And I'm going to help you get there but I'm only going to do it under the rubric of a public system that is universally available to all Americans. So, so in the book, right, you bring up, and I, I'm scratching, I've got to find his name, but the CEO of General Motors in the, in the 50s kind yes. of had the same choice, right? He could have, you can imagine he, they could have- I mean, he away. could have gone that route. Yeah. Um, and the route he took instead was to say, look, these unions, are beginning to regionalize and organize, and they're beginning to talk about offering health insurance as one of the benefits to their union members. And we're fighting like crazy because these guys are striking us and everything else. So I'll tell you what we're gonna do. General Motors is gonna beat them to the punch and we're gonna give them insurance. And it all looked great back then because you didn't have many retirees and you had tons of employees and no, no, healthcare no. didn't cost too much either, right? They no, were just no, covering no. like hospitalization. That was it, right? No pharmaceuticals. So, you know, so he goes ahead and does it. And the only problem is 50 years later, the whole thing is reversed. We've got just a few workers still. And now we got all these pensioners. And who the heck's going to support them? And the cost has gone up like tenfold. So, you know, things change, I guess, is what it is. <laughs> but, you know, I do think, um, I do think you're right. I'm, I am not advocating for the great innovators and masterminds of our capitalist system uh, to disappear, just the opposite. I'm looking for them to demonstrate public spirited behavior. Mm -hmm. And the reality is the reason we're in trouble, the reason why Cold Blue tells a story of severe vulnerability, predicts a COVID would collapse us and kill us, is because we systematically, especially over the past three decades, stripped away the protections that were in place so that uh, behavior would not go awry. And now we're at a point where no one's really in control. We can't even find out what we're supposed to pay. We got 16 workers for every one doctor. And the people are still out there afraid and worried. What do they want? They don't want to be able to just uh, handle things through telemedicine. They want compassion. They want understanding. They want partnership. Uh, when they feel something, they want to know it's not a cancer. They want to go to somebody, have them touch it and say, no, it's just a bump. It'll go away. And then they take a sigh of relief and they go to work the next day. You know, that's the way stable civic societies work. That's why in the book, I say the severe irony was back in, in around 1950 when they crucified Truman for suggesting national health care and, uh, and took him down. And at the very same time, our taxpayer money, my father's taxes, were paying for the Marshall Plan to build national health care systems in Germany and Japan. <laughs> those, those systems still exist today, but it wasn't good enough for we Americans. No, we were going to beat this system with our great ingenuity and terrific science. And we confused scientific progress with human progress. What we need in this country right now is a little humanity. I think Trump has made that perfectly clear. If, if there was something missing in the culture, it's the humanity. 
It's not the technology, and, but, but I, I'd love technology and science to demand public service and humanity and to build it under that rubric. That could be a winning combination. Fantastic. Well, I think uh, we, 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 we've come to the end of our hour, Mike. It's been, you know, uh, really Amazing. entertaining. It's a very entertaining read. Um, for those of you who haven't done your history, it's one of those, great, there are a few of these great books in, I think this is up there with, with things like Social Transformation of American Medicine, The Mining Medical Excellence, which go back into the history of where do we come from. And you've got, you know, if you're, if you're working in healthcare today, most of you probably are, you should take, take a look at this because it's one of those really fascinating things is that we didn't get here in a vacuum. We didn't get, and we're not going to get out of this. <laughs> and I like to think that, uh, you know, Code Blue kind of begins in a way where Paul Starr's uh, book on social transformation of medicine ends. Right. Uh, he had, I think, some of the same observations. And uh, the one thing I'd like to emphasize is that, you know, it is complicated because that's the way we made it. And it took me a long time to unravel it to figure it out. And I was on the inside of it all my life, but I'm hopeful that in enjoying this read, uh, a person for the first time says, oh, okay, that's how we got in this mess. Now let's see how we can get out of it. Mike, it's such a pleasure to talk with you. And truly for anybody who has wondered how the hell did we end up here? This is a book to, to at least give you a good explanation to start with. And it's like, um, I don't know, to me, it's, I've been watching a lot of um, mob movies here in this pandemic, and it's just like, this fit right into this, this whole thing. It's just like the healthcare version yeah. of a mob movie to me. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us. The book again is Code Blue. Matthew, can you hold it up, please? All right, um, Code Blue, Mike McGee, thank you so much for joining us. And for those of you, thanks for tuning in to the THCB Book Club. We will be back again with our next selection. Um, you can find all the information up about that on the healthcareblog.com slash backslash book club um, and we will let you know what we will what we will be reading next we'll see you guys soon matthew thank you mike again a pleasure to speak with you thank Talk you again. thank you jess and thank you matthew Bye.